uh, at uh, food processing, okay? And we saw from the processing, we saw mechanical processing, we looked at... Uh, uh, as, uh, ...techniques in processing, we looked at preservation, we looked at packaging, and all other things that were in that uh, module. So if we didn't attend, maybe it will ourselves product development, a bit of more product development because uh, we are in newer ship skills in nutrition and uh, most of the things that we are learning in with nutrition here to, to do it, we'll be looking at consumer behavior analysis and also looking at the different uh, forms that the businesses are, look like up. Uh, at a few slides. Then I'll also be looking at uh, consumer needs and trends and also, uh, like I had said earlier, we'll be looking at uh, consumer behavior analysis. At the end of the day, we are looking at the consumer to be making our entrepreneurial venture as successful as we would like it to be. Uh, uh, to begin with, uh, we'll uh, at least talk of uh, the different... Okay, let's look at these are uh, the forms of the businesses that you could conduct or things that could earn you some money in nutrition. Because, well, most people look at nutrition uh, being uh, uh, only part of health care, whereby if you're not employed in maybe a clinic, a nutrition clinic or a health and wellness center, you're going to be employed in a refugee setting where you're going to be uh, providing the therapeutic feeds, you're going to be doing the community nutrition, etc. But well, we realize that uh, things like nutrition counseling, whereby uh, now we have nutrition counselors who are making it out there, they're making huge amounts of money, uh, and these come with nutrition bloggers, people who go and put up the information out there. So uh, really, uh, this slide is just to interest you with a few options we have after uh, harnessing this knowledge of nutrition, things we could do uh, to change our lives and also to change the lives of people around us and those uh, who are dependent. Okay, I don't want to, to use that word because when we use the word dependent, it shows that someone can't exist without you. But trust me, the only people who can't exist without uh, uh, others are the children, those that are below six months. Once you're above six months, uh, now you can eat this other type of food, then I think you're not dependent on anyone. You're only dependent on God. Yeah. So like I had said, uh, you could uh, do nutrition counseling, then uh, lectures and workshops on proper food and nutrition. Uh, like right now, I'm a, a tutor, okay? Uh, but because of the knowledge I have in nutrition, uh, I could earn, I can earn, I earn something out of it. So we should not uh, imprison ourselves with looking at weight management, uh, looking at uh, going for management of moderate acute malnutrition, management of severe acute malnutrition, micronutrient deficiencies. No, that is not uh, the only option we have. Uh, we need to think outside the box. Actually, we need to think like there is no box for us to think about, uh, expand widely our knowledge. Uh, effective stress management, uh, this has been proven uh, to be a key, a key skill that comes with nutrition once uh, people find uh, uh, most of uh, uh, the, the, the stresses can be managed nutritionally. You can, if you ask how, then we will go into what people love doing. You could interest them with cooking lessons. You could interest them with the, uh, those foods, the fresh food. You could interest them with organic nutrition. A lot of things. Uh, and also you could uh, bring up uh, issues with counseling because we realize that people get a lot of stress. And once uh, people are stressed in terms, they tend to overeat. And when they overeat, they grow this. So managing that still you are in business with nutrition. Uh, proper physical fitness, organization of wellness fairs, I talked of this, and customized and wellness uh, programs to meet specific needs of uh, your clients. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think some of us have uh, looked at those clinics that are now 
uh, I think there is this thing of eating according to your blood group, okay? Uh, people are talking of when, when your blood group O, your blood group A, B, your blood group B, your blood group A, or your, your blood group something. Uh, you're supposed to only eat, uh, okay, it's not you're supposed to only eat, but then there are those foods they say that uh, your body could uh, react well to uh, compared, to, uh, they could be more beneficial to your body compared to other foods once taken in. So friends, even if... Uh, we understand we don't want you to be quacks in the in, in the field, but we really want uh, you to always find a way of expanding this nutrition uh, beyond what meets the eye or what meets the head uh, in terms of what people perceive when we, when we talk about nutrition. Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, one of our blades that we'll be looking at uh, in the, the product development strategies. Yeah, like I said, these are a few highlights. And we are saying uh, there is a screening phase, okay? Yeah. And we are saying this uh, screening phase in a product development is a critical step to determine whether to proceed with an idea or not, okay? And you see that is very vital. Once you do not do the screening, uh, then uh, you could proceed with something and end up wasting a lot of resources. And by resources, we are talking of time, we are talking of money, we are talking of you yourself, even your emotions, I think, are your resources at the end of the day. And we are saying it involves thorough testing of product concepts that align with the organizational goals and assess market acceptability, uh, ingredient availability, and regulatory factors. Uh, this we could, uh, I think, align it a little with prototyping. And uh, uh, if you've seen some products, uh, the product comes and it disappears in, within a short period of time. And uh, you, try, you start to wonder and say, I thought this was a big brand. How comes uh, this big brand has released the product, uh, but then the product has gone off market very quickly? Uh, sometimes, even if the product is doing well, but uh, the, the, the company sees uh, the profit man margin is very low, then it looks at uh, maybe cost of production. The cost of production is really high. Then they look at maybe they can't... Uh, sustain having this product on the market, so they tend to scrap it off. And uh, those are things uh, sometimes that come with screening. Sometimes it is uh, that the customers have not really accepted the product. However much you may think uh, customers have accepted it because it is relative, uh, a few customers, 1,000 out of 2 million customers could have accepted that. And to a company, that is a multinational, it feels that is a very, very low acceptability. Uh, collaboration between departments is essential to evaluate financial, legal, process, equipment, purchasing, and consumer factors, uh, like I had explained earlier. And we are saying market analysis and consumer research are crucial uh, in this one, uh, with consumer testing being vital to understand the consumer needs and preferences and feasibility. This we talked of even uh, earlier on after you doing all those assessments, after you doing the sensory evaluations, ETC, then uh, after you're done with that phase, then bring out the product to the market. But don't go and start releasing batches, okay? At least we could, uh, uh, there is that saying of not testing the depth of the river with both feet, yeah. So you test the depth of the river with one foot and put out the first batch and if maybe uh, give to those few retailers who you trust, who how you have confidence in, and put it out there on the market. If it doesn't work well, then maybe go back to the drawing board and look at factors uh, that may have failed and then come back with something new. So sometimes look at uh, uh, companies have come up with uh, their uh, incubation period. And in saying incubation period, uh, that is the time when they are on a break even. Okay. Actually, even sometimes when they are making loss, okay, they are even not recovering the cost of production. But then they are putting the product out there in the market uh, to see how it can run. Some people have a, an incubation period of four months. They have a product uh, on market for four months. Then others have an incubation period of one full year. Okay, They believe that the longer the incubation period, at least the people will uh, start liking the product and take it out. Then others feel they don't have all that time and liberty to put out a product for that long. Uh, so that's why the screening step uh, is very crucial. Uh, considerations include uh, regulations, technology, and finances. And the interdepartmental teams help address uh, 
the initial questions about uh, attainability uh, throughout the development process. Okay, uh, so the different departments come up and you look at the challenges. Okay, what uh, what is the finance department saying? Uh, what is uh, uh, the, the, the department in terms of uh, or the legal affairs? The, is this a product we are putting a uh, safe? Is, and, and we're going to find uh, legal claims to whatever it is, maybe copyright, maybe patent right, maybe uh, whatever right, okay? Yeah, so all those, if it looks like a different product that is on the market, can we ably register it? Can we certify it? Uh, can we sell it beyond uh, borders, etc.? So that's why uh, this screening step uh, or screening phase uh, is uh, important uh, in product uh uh, product development uh, as in the product development strategy. Well, uh, we will now interest ourselves with also consumer preferences, okay? And what determines the consumer preferences? Uh, when we are looking at this, I will be looking at, okay, fine, now you, you're, you're screening, but what are those things you're going to first look at, okay, uh, before you could uh, uh, bring it to the customer? Okay, I think you're seeing how the consumer preference is kind of related uh, to the screening we're talking about. And we're saying that consumer preference is uh, influenced by variety of factors, which include age, region, ethnicity, non-religious beliefs and income. And we're saying uh, understanding this uh, is critical for product developers to create products that meet uh, the standards and the market trends. Okay. Yeah. So the points of age in most cases are uh, also economic factors, social factors, uh, ethnicity, I think all that is covered. And also there are uh, interpersonal factors that we will maybe discuss uh, at length later on. Uh, so friends, uh, we are saying age, uh, so the consumer's preferences are influenced by age due to experience and scientific, and scientific beliefs. Sorry. So for instance, growing up, uh, with the idea that margarine is healthier than butter can affect one's choice at a grocery store. So this is what we are looking at. Uh, also, maybe what we know here is I think margarine makes our children taller, okay? According to the ads that run on TV every day, they show you that child who is eating bread with margarine growing a few inches taller, which is not proven, surely, which is not proven. It's nowhere... And uh, I think there hasn't been any conclusive research that shows uh, eating a lot of margarine will help you increase in height. But however, uh, right now uh, people are looking at those uh, facts and thinking that uh, margarine is uh, healthier than butter. So uh, when they go to the grocery store and uh, they are looking at, for uh, options at the grocery store, they will try as much as possible to make sure uh, that they buy those products that have butter instead of margarine. Well, uh, you could argue it out with them, but then that's what they have at the, the back of their minds. So uh, age also brings you unique food choices uh, with young consumers preferring uh, trendy options compared to the elderly. Uh, with the elderly, it is no longer about uh, trends, okay? For them, they are, I think they have that uh, we have seen it all attitude, okay? So uh, at the end of the day, they are looking at uh, what is healthy, okay? Uh, it is not the crispy, it is not the designs, it is not anything, but uh, surely for them, they will be looking at the food value or the nutrients they're getting uh, out of uh, that particular food, okay? Yeah. Uh, also, we are looking at uh, uh, here, still age, you look at uh, the children, uh, saying that now uh, since uh, uh, actually sweet, sweet things, okay, sweeter things are more, more preferred uh, to children compared to savory things. And it is the elderly who I think like those bitter tastes. I don't know what's behind elderly people liking bitter tastes, but I think uh, it is an age factor too. Okay, so let's shift to religion, and we are saying uh, religious denominations affect food preferences. For example, uh, some Catholics and Protestants may abstain from eating meat uh, on certain holidays. Yes, uh, as Christians, uh, we associate uh, eating meat on uh, these uh, public holidays as celebrating, I think that is uh, from Holy Thursday to Easter, 
Easter Sunday until Jesus rises from the grave. Uh, we do not eat meat, I think. Yeah. Uh, because of issues to do with religion, but then also still uh, we know our brothers and sisters, uh, the Muslims, uh, they adhere to the halal dietary standards, whereby they do not consume pork, they do not take alcohol, uh, and all those other types of foods that were forbidden uh, by the in the Old Testament that God forbid the Israelites not to eat. Yeah. So Jews follow kosher laws uh, that prohibit foods and guidelines for meal preparations. Yes, uh, with the with the Jews, uh, there is a hint, uh, some information on a uh, different. Uh, I'm forgetting what they are called. Uh, even Jews themselves have different partitions. Okay. Yeah, but the, 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 those Jews uh, that I think have hair coils at at the end of their hair. I'm forgetting their name. They have different uh, rituals. I think they perform even before they eat meat. Right? Yeah. So all these things to do with religion should be taken into consideration when you're developing your product. Okay. If you're going to uh, look at an international market, make sure that you're not uh, having, for example, okay, now you're frying, but you're using ghee. That, uh, not ghee, you're using oil that you have, you have obtained from pork, but now you want to uh, use the same oil, make biscuits, use the same oil, make uh, whatever kind of uh, butter product it is, or bread product it is, but now you want to sell it to the Arabic countries. So you need to be very cautious of these things uh, when you're making your different products. However, Maybe different regions like different things. I've seen uh, our friends, the Chinese, eating things that uh, here we would not tend to eat. Okay, so if you want to produce something like that or make a product like that, go out there and give it to them. That is in terms of religions, uh, due to different religious denominations, because we are indoctrinated that way, uh, we have limits and say, we wouldn't be uh, very comfortable eating that. Uh, we are also saying that ethnic background plays a significant role in food choices, and uh, people with Hispanic roots have different uh, food uh, preferences from uh, those who are in India. And we are also saying uh, that uh, childhood experiences uh, shape adult cravings. Okay, yeah. Uh, your, your, your background... Uh, 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 for example, when we talk of Hispanic, uh, Hispanic is a term uh, used uh, to mean uh, 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 like the people uh, who have ancestral ties uh, to Latin America. Okay, uh, uh, Latin America here we are looking at uh, uh, we are looking at Mexico, we are looking at Colombia. Okay, they have a few traits, few traits from Spain but also Latin America. That's why you see the people who are in Latin America, people call them Latinos. But uh, uh, these people, uh, they have different food choices uh, from those uh, that uh, originate in India. For example, India, we know that uh, these people like, uh, I don't know, they like spices. Okay, There is no spice that you, there is no spice that you will come up with that an Indian doesn't have. And I think it makes their food taste good. I think I've eaten uh, uh, that pilau they make. I'm forgetting its name. Yeah, but the rice is really good. Uh, so uh, we realize that these ethnic ethnicities, uh, these are, are Red Indians. Uh, Red Indians, okay, their ancestors, uh, the generation, the offsprings of the Red Indians and the Spanish uh, have different food choices compared to the Indians. Uh, Non-religious beliefs, for example, uh, vegetarianism driven by concerns like animal welfare, health, environmental sustainability, and they are saying those who prioritize local and organic foods have beliefs that align with their choices. Uh, these non-religious beliefs surely uh, are things that people come up with uh, on their own. Uh, for example, when we talk of vegetarianism, in vegetarianism, people are looking at uh, uh, they, they can't be having maybe a cat, maybe a dog at home, which is an animal, but then they are eating uh, meat, okay? So I don't know, maybe at the end of the day, at the back of their mind, they are thinking that 
I I am a traitor if I'm eating meat, but then I have I'm rearing. Uh, okay, I'm keeping a dog as a pet, and they, uh, this has come from the Western world, where surely they have very many feelings attached. To, and I'm also an animal activist, but uh, when it comes to people eating these animals, I think it, this is food that was created. Uh, but I know uh, a lot of criticism comes uh, out of that they expect animals to live. Uh, that uh, Also, people have said that the more we consume animals, uh, for example, Indians, I think, don't... I don't know that they eat beef, but then I think some of them uh, feel the cow is spiritual, something like that. I'm not sure, so sure. These are all things that I'm putting in quotes. So don't go anywhere saying Robert said this, Robert said that. I'm not so sure about these, these issues. But I know uh, there is some there is something sacred about cows to them. Okay, yeah, I think it's the Hindus, right? Yeah, and also people feel that when you eat these animals, you get an animal-like spirit. And you know, if an animal-like spirit is a new uh, you will be more of a, a destroyer compared to these herbivores. If you look at the herbivores themselves, the herbivores are a little slow to life. Okay, They eat their grass, then they live well, and they die. They are very calm. But once you start eating these animals, uh, maybe you also get the animal spirit in you. It's a lot of beliefs, really. But vegetarianism is picking up. Uh, the, the trend is picking up, and uh, people are uh, aligning it with the uh, weight loss. So... Yeah, those non-religious beliefs are also there. And uh, also a, a preservation of these animals. That's why the environmental sustainability, people are looking at us uh, being uh, like the top destroyer of the food web. We are everywhere in the ecosystem and destroying it. But at the end of the day, we want to eat meat. Okay, and I'm for meat too. Uh, the income... Uh, a point to note that uh, the vegetarian or the people who are more aligned with not eating meat have come up with the different types of meat. I think we've, we've heard of soy meat, which is meat at the end of the day, that uh, people are also starting to make meat from the lab, uh, which is uh, saddening, but I think it is coming. Yeah. So uh, income income is a critical factor, friends, and we are saying the income levels of food shopping behavior. Uh, lower income individuals may have limited access to organic and local foods, while higher consumers are more likely to purchase such products. Uh, so, friends, here with this point, we are looking at the Western world, surely. Okay. Uh, here in our uh, LDCs, you know, developing countries, uh, we 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 are still more of organic. At the end of the day, you will see that it is the people who are well to do that are not and are, are going to eat unhealthy. But people who do not have the money are still going to go and eat their organic produce because at the end of the day, they're eating things direct from their gardens. Uh, but in developing countries, the burgers, the burger shops are everywhere, uh, and I don't know. People have uh, brought a lot of uh, 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 theories to eat. Uh, which I don't want to go into, but uh, surely we understand uh, that here in uh, Africa and maybe some other low developing countries, people eat direct from their gardens. Uh, it is those people who are high on life. But also we have uh, a, a population of urban dwellers who are not doing very well, so they also are uh, attempted to... Uh, you know, have a diet of only each commando. Here we, did, we call it commando, but still, it is the, that uh, chapati plus beans. So that is their diet. So we are saying income levels influence the shopping behavior. And also, we are saying the community. Okay. A community plays a factor in, in our local culture and, and access to certain foods in a community uh, impact food choices. A city with abundant farmers markets attract consumers to buy locally, and states with a particular food production specialty influence local diets. Eagle less fish consumption uh, yeah, in Kansas compared to mine. Yeah, I think uh, when you have uh, that uh, a lot of farmers bringing a lot of produce uh, to the market, then we we'll tend to opt for the what the farmers have brought to the market than us going outside there and purchasing uh, from uh, the sellers out there. So, friends, we have looked at screening, and now in screening we are looking at you bringing uh, that commodity 
to the uh, uh, to the consumers. But then the consumer preferences affect the screening stage. So it is very key for you to understand what factors affect the consumer preferences so that you could tackle them and come up uh, with something better after you're doing your screening. Uh, so today we are going to be shifting gears and we are going to be looking at uh, the different forms uh, of business organization. I think this we should have seen a little earlier, but then uh, it is good that uh, uh, it has come right now. So uh, first we are going to be looking at uh, soil proprietorship. Okay? And we'll be looking at, at its advantages and disadvantages. Right. Uh, so uh, with sole proprietorship, we are saying that this is a type of business structure where a single individual owns and operates the business. Okay. You're the, you're the everything of the business. I don't want to use the words of Alpha and Omega. Those are only left for God. Uh, but you're everything of the business. Okay. You're the one who knows uh, how everything flows. Uh, in your business. And what are the advantages of uh, this uh, sole proprietorship? We are saying it's a uh, low startup costs, okay? You're not bringing anyone on board. It is only you. You're the one deciding, okay, now I want to start my business right now. I want to uh, open up this uh, nutrition wellness center right now. Uh, maybe it will close at this time. So all that is about you. So these low startup costs, really you're not engaging a lot of people. You could actually, people have started with very, very little capitals. Okay. little amounts of capital, like you only have a desk and a chair, and you rent a room of 100,000, paint it, 100,000 Uganda shillings. I know you people trade in dollars. When I talk about 100,000 uh, dollars, maybe that's a different amount of money compared to what we use here. 100,000 Uganda shillings is uh, around uh, uh, 30 dollars. Yeah, seven thirty dollars USD. Yeah, so uh, that is it. We've looked at a uh, sole proprietorship being a type of business structure where a single individual owns and operates the business. Okay, yeah. Uh, we are looking at low startup costs and minimal working capital uh, require tax advantage to small owners and all profits to the owner. Sure, uh, this is uh, a little self-explanatory. Okay, uh, tax advantage to owners. Okay, this we could say. Maybe, but then uh, sometimes we find that our government still will come and tax these single owners because they know if they don't tax it immediately, it may disappear into thin air because these ones are prone to disappearing. Uh, these business uh, forms like this. Okay, uh, greatest freedom from regulations. You don't need to have a lot of paperwork, okay? Yeah, when you're setting up this sole proprietorship. And we're also saying that the owner is an indirect. Uh, control. Okay, so we are looking at uh, uh, lack of the disadvantages of this sole proprietorship. However much it is good for you to be alone, there could be some uh, challenges that come up, come in uh, if you're doing business alone. But well, if you don't have anyone to do business with, then that is not a factor that will limit you. You can set things alone, and people will find you uh, on the way. Okay, so a uh, lack of continuity for the owner there is. We know this has happened almost everywhere. Where, where by, uh, the person who knew how to purchase, who knew from who to purchase, uh, they didn't teach their offspring then Once they die or once they, uh, they, they are weak, or sidelined, we don't want to use death as well, or they lose interest. Okay, when a sole proprietor loses interest in the business, they are just going to end everything unless they sell it to someone who has the same interest. But everything just disappears out of the blue. Okay, we are looking at difficulty in raising capital since you are alone. Okay, yeah. So once you are alone, then I mean, you're not going to have a lot of funds that come in. But then, if you, for example, as other business firms will see, there are members who will help you raise up this capital. And once you raise this capital, yeah, it will be uh, good for you uh, to have this capital always. And also, uh, lastly, we are looking at unlimited liability. Okay, And we are saying that this refers uh, to full personal responsibility of the owner uh, or partner in terms of debts. Okay? Once there is unlimited liability, that means, my friend, even if... Uh, anything that, everything that happens to business is on you, 
Okay. Let me, let me think that happens to like businesses on you. You're not going to say, okay, we are in this together. You're in this alone. I think that's the term that is uh, to be used here. All right. Uh, so still we are looking at uh, these explained uh, partnerships. Uh, so this was uh, a blade for partnerships. Sorry. Okay. We looked at sole proprietorship, but then these should have been partnerships. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think we will edit that before I share the slides, okay? Yeah. Uh, we are saying uh, partnerships are easy to form, okay? Partnerships, uh, this form of business as well, we are looking at partnerships. Uh, we are saying these are easy to establish, uh, requiring less uh, less formal uh, documentation and legal formalities. And we are also saying uh, uh, low startup costs. Uh, to set up a partnership, uh, as a business form, we are saying uh, it is typically lower than those for corporations. We'll be looking at what corporations are, and we are saying it makes it an uh, attractive option for small businesses. Mm, additional sources of capital, we are saying uh, these can tap into uh, other financial resources uh, of multiple partners, which can provide more substantial pool for capital for business growth. Like we are looked at sole proprietorship. And when we looked at sole proprietorship, we looked at you being the owner and running everything alone. But now once you have partners on board, a partner could uh, uh, go sideways into their own business, uh, part of that, and get uh, some social capital from there. Uh, broader management base, and we are looking at, uh, since you're not alone, you ha you're having a group of people you're running this, you're running this business with, uh, the, the, the broader the, the group, the broader the skills, the broader the expertise and perspectives which can enhance uh, good decision making uh, and problem solving. All right. Uh, there is also a possible tax advantage in partnerships. Uh, we are saying uh, 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 these have uh, to pass through taxation. Uh, these often have passed through taxation meaning profits and losses are passed through to partners, okay, are potentially resulting to lower tax liability compared to some other business structures. Like sole proprietorship still, that's what I'll use as an example here. Uh, looking at uh, these uh, low tax advantage, uh, the possible tax advantage uh, on uh, these partnerships as a business form, we are saying that uh, uh, all partners are on board, okay, yeah, and everyone is going to contribute their fair share of the tax. And once they are contributing a fair share of the tax, that means that everyone uh, is going to pay something small compared to if the, all the, the, the amount to pay in taxes was paid uh, by uh, a single individual.